almost 100% transparency of all the actions mm -hmm. which are done by a government mm -hmm. are, are there, is there yes. on the internet. Yes. Uh, citizens can participate. Mm -hmm. What kind of efforts has it taken to reach this point? Not much. Um, for example, when we begin this conversation, I ask you to read the protocol of radical transparency, the visit that Peter's the TW. So I guess it took us a couple of days to figure out that um, regulation, right? That protocol, what uh, license to use. We use Creative Commons and so on. Uh, but after that initial investment in the infrastructure is done, it's automatic. Uh, if I just press record, uh, if you want to do a transcript, we have a pipeline to do such transcripts. If you don't uh, and publish a video instead, well, you, I think you chose the video uh, route. Uh, we just have a YouTube channel which costs nothing. Uh, and so I think there's neither time nor um, financial uh, cost in maintaining such a pipeline. Some uh, work is needed to design it so that it's compliant with the existing acts uh, in our legal system, the Lobbying Act, the Personal Information Protection Act, uh, the Public Services Act, and so on, Freedom of Information Act. But after this yeah. initial work, it's not much work. This I understand. I was more talking about, you know, I would imagine that a couple of your colleagues in the government would not be as open as you are. But I'm not uh, forcing them to. I, I'm just doing this for myself. Yeah, I, I was uh, explaining that I only do this for the meetings that I chair. So I'm not forcing this on anyone. That's the first thing. And the second thing is everyone in my office joined by their voluntary uh, will. Uh, they uh, were maybe uh, public servants in other ministries and for each ministry we can have a secondment to my office. So they already know that they have to work out loud that there's radical transparency going on. And because my mandate uh, is open government, social innovation and youth engagement, these are the kind of things that are very much fit for the radical transparency and participation. So for example, I don't have anyone from the Ministry of Defense in my office. I don't force the Ministry of Defense uh, to do whatever that I'm doing. So uh, I'm doing well uh, with my colleagues. And the ministry that actually send people to my office, for example, about communication, culture, education, finance, uh, nowadays also foreign affairs for public diplomacy, um, and so on, uh, of course, they already understand uh, their main job is to work closely with the people, not just for the people. So can you give us a few words how this radical transparency is linked with participation? Definitely. Because one thing doesn't go with the other, right? Of course. And that's, uh, I, I would say it's a fundamental thing people very, very often misunderstand when they talk about the internet. Mm -hmm, definitely. Uh, for example, on the internet, everything that constitutes the internet is written in the RFC documents. That's the internet protocols that defines how the internet works. Imagine if these documents were not transparent. Imagine if they're hidden behind proprietary code and um, standard document that you have to pay a large fee to access. Then there wouldn't be much participation. People can talk all they want about internet governance, but if they don't have access to even the core internet protocol documents, participation makes no sense. And on the other hand, if there's a lot of participation and governance and so on, but if the decisions are not made in the place where people can see the decisions transparently, then it ceases to be binding. Uh, the participation, the working groups and so on will not have an effect to the internet as a whole because the internet makes innovations possible at the edges, meaning that the innovators may be unknown uh, strangers to most of the internet community. It's thanking to the shared transparency infrastructure that these new innovations, nowadays we take some of them for granted, like the World Wide Web, which wasn't around when internet was first designed, or the secure Absolutely. connection for the World Wide Web, or the nowadays what we call distributed ledger, how to overcome civil attacks uh, to make sure 
sure that everyone can participate in the membership system of say uh, blockchains and so on all this um, is not possible to innovate on the internet if not for the radical transparency on how the internet itself works how has your work what you've been doing over the last couple of years in the government how has this influenced other governments yeah um, is there any kind of i mean i feel they should all run and learn from you mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but is there any kind of run definitely uh so if we limit to just uh the past couple of years uh, for example, Japan is now setting up uh, its own digital agency uh, with up to a hundred people from the civil society, from the outside of the cabinet office. Uh, and I'm in mostly talks to the special advisor, uh, Professor Murai, uh, who are advising this work of digital agency. So this is a very clear bilateral co uh, collaboration. Or for example, our system of fighting the pandemic with no lockdown and the infodemic with no takedown. Uh, these systems were, um, I wouldn't say copied, but adapted heavily by, say, the Korean people who uh, used the same mask availability uh, API to visualize the availability of PPEs in the counter-pandemic effort. There's also uh, many smaller, like municipal scale uh, collaborations, like I was in Thailand uh, in the Jularong Gong University, and they worked on a smaller scale uh, collaborative fact-checking, cofact.org, with the local civil society. And there's also um, the presidential hackathon, which is uh, the Taiwan um, social innovation incubator that uh, runs a national competition that selects the top five teams each year and they each receive a trophy from the president promising that uh, their idea will be implemented by the public service uh, in the next year. Uh, the trophy is a projector that pro projects the president, so it's the presidential uh, yeah. cup. Uh, and that uh, winners uh, have worked with, say, the New Zealand, the Wellington Water Company on water leakage detection and so on, and the system has also uh, being adapted uh, to the GovTech uh, Lining Lab uh, program in New Zealand. So we work on our parallel system, but then we share our methodology and even our champion teams uh, with one another. Mm -hmm. There's many more, uh, but these are the things that I think of at the top of my mind. I mean, the application for companies would also be a huge opportunity, actually. Is there any conversation going on? Yes. Uh, I think one of the most exciting development in Taiwan is that this idea of social innovation is now embraced uh, by the economic sector as well. Uh, and so, for example, we have the um, annual Asia-Pacific Social Innovation Partnership Award, uh, where we reward the companies that participate in this sort of digital uh, social innovations. And uh, there's many very exciting circular economies uh, or um, the um, like sustainable agricultural, um, biotechnology, health technology, and so on, uh, that are all embracing the same idea of making sure we work with the people, not just for the people. So, for example, if people work on um, dedicating medical masks quota to the international humanitarian aid, instead of we deciding how many to dedicate, we work with the people uh, to basically use an app that has more than 10 million people downloading uh, in the Google Play and also in App Store and people can send their dedications of their mask rations to international humanitarian aid as they would uh, to join other data collaboratives such as sharing their health data uh, with fellow people with diabetes or with similar conditions, chronic conditions uh, to do research together and to uh, make suggestions to each other and so on. And similar collaborative exist on air quality, water quality, many sort of uh, environment sensing. There's a company that makes a Pokemon Go-like game to make sure that people go and refill their bottles of water instead of buying new plastic and get push notification yeah. when there's uh, heat damage possibility and so on. So it's a very vibrant uh, social uh, innovator entrepreneurship ecosystem. And from the user point of view, if I, as a participant mm -hmm. in these uh, mm. in these projects, mm. uh, is it my decision mm -hmm. which data 
I'm going to give you? Oh yeah, definitely. Or is it the other way around? Of course, you get to decide which data you share. Uh, after all, uh, the health bank uh, in the Taiwan National Health Insurance only serves as a uh, custodian uh, of the data. But the data is still between you and your doctor or between you and your dentist uh, and things like that because it's the foundation of trust. So while, of course, we do publish statistics, like I just said about 10 million people downloading, I don't think that's your data, by the way. <laughs> You're just one in the 10 million. Right, part of the count. Uh, but if it's uh, identifiable, then of course uh, it's all with your consent. We have a very European style, uh, like just before GDPR, a European style personal data protection act. Mm -hmm. So your actions are all central government based. Sure. How does this break down to the local administrations? Do they use equivalent systems as well? Many systems were prototyped by the municipal government before promoted via presidential hackathon uh, to national scale. So, for example, uh, the air quality measurement, uh, it's first done in Taoyuan City, Taipei City, and other cities. The sort of participatory budgeting, for example, was prototyped um, in, say, Taichung, uh, or uh, nowadays, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the environmental sensing work centers around Tainan City and so on. So, I would say that the municipals serve as prototypers, and the central government makes sure it's sustainable and can do so at scale. The international connection is also what we are uh, helping them but um, I don't think uh, I do anything in a top-down way so it's uh, of course the mask rationing map are just from a few people in Tainan city and they don't have to travel to Taipei they can just code away in Tainan and then uh, we amplify their work making it civic infrastructure nationwide so you piece it basically together yes that the tapestry becomes yes, bigger. Yes, definitely. Yeah, because yeah. it's universal broadband, so no matter where they are, uh, with video conferencing, we can all be in the same room anyway. Yeah. So, uh, how is your big neighbor looking at all of this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mean Australia? Okay, you don't mean Australia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Um, uh, I think uh, there's a couple of things, right? Um, the PRC regime also talks about transparency, but they mean uh, making the citizen transparent to the state, uh, which is uh, exactly the other direction that we were talking about, which was about making the state transparent to the citizens. And so I think um, what they are um, developing there is also very interesting. But we uh, mainly use that as a reminder uh, of what not to do. Uh, and, and this is, I guess, also useful in a sense. Uh, and the PRC regime uh, also uh, understand that they had a problem because of the lack of the participation, for example, from the journalist uh, sector. So they are at a disadvantage uh, in discovering emergent trends. For example, in Taiwan, because we have a civic infrastructure, uh, the PTT, something like Reddit, but not a company, just National mm -hmm. Taiwan University Students Pet Project, no advertiser, <coughs> no shareholder. So Dr. Li Wenliang's message from Wuhan about the COVID, uh, about, quote, SARS happen again, unquote, uh, reached the Taiwanese people in just 24 hours and we start health inspections. But uh, the same message from Dr. Li Wenliang, because of no press free them, no participation in the online civic infrastructure when it comes to the um, you know uh, epidemic uh, issues. So it did not reach the people in Wuhan. Uh, and so Wuhan had to go to a lockdown uh, a couple of weeks later. And so this uh, mm -hmm. contrast, I think, also prompts them to think maybe there are possibilities uh, to uh, engage the civic sector more or maybe journalist freedom is still important. I understand many people in the PRC are thinking uh, along these lines, but at the moment, their central government regime did not uh, show the sign to uh, reopen for journalist freedom. Yeah. Uh, how do you think that these activities, this radical transparency, participation has an effect, impact on the Taiwanese society? 
Mm -hmm. How will it strengthen mm -hmm. it? Are there any kind of weak points on the other side? Mm -hmm. I think one of the weak points uh, and, uh, is the inclusion. Uh, for example, uh, we had a lot of uh, freedom of information uh, data. But if you don't speak Mandarin, if you only speak English uh, or German, it's not as accessible to you. The same if you speak the other national languages of Taiwan, for example, the indigenous languages. Uh, these are mm. not automatically translated. Or, for example, if you are very young, like when I was 15 years old, uh, I'm often told that I'm too young to vote. And therefore, democratic participation is not for me. I have to wait until I'm of the voting age. Uh, that's another weakness. So nowadays, with the National Action Plan on Open Government, we're looking to expand the inclusive access of participation and agenda-setting opportunities to new immigrants, to indigenous people and people who don't speak Mandarin, as well as to very young people. And what are the strengthening impacts? I think the, what do you have yeah, seen? the most important impact is that people understand that democracy relies on everyone improving the bandwidth, the bitrate of communication together. Democracy is not a fossilized structure of each person uploading two bits every four years, which is called voting, but rather about everyone participating in the here and now. And because of this renewed culture, for a lot of emerging issues that threaten to divide the society from disinformation crisis to marriage equality uh, to many other issues in Taiwan, we were able to co-create innovative solutions that doesn't leave anyone behind and people can live with. So I would say the polity become um, more uh, coherent in that people can blend their relations in a truly transcultural way more because of this digital democracy efforts. And how many people do actually participate? Do you mm -hmm. have any numbers? Yeah, I do, uh, actually. The National Health Insurance app, as I mentioned, uh, has uh, 10 million or more uh, people using it out of a country of 23 million. Uh, the digital democracy platform, the joint platform, regularly has anywhere between 8 to 10 million people uh, every year uh, using it, uh, again, out of a country of 23 million people. So a lot of those larger efforts um, claim uh, more than half of the adult population or slightly less than half when you measure the total population. <laughs> I was extremely fascinated when I went on your platform about the finance plans, oh, yes. which are really uh, transparent here. Yes, very much uh, so. I would imagine if I look at my hometown, which is rather left liberal, uh, they would be shocked to see this. And many of the people, uh, I'm not sure if they would really engage. So. What do you receive from your citizens on these financial plans the government is laying out? And what, you know, uh, were there any kind of hurdles to overcome? Uh, what is your experience on this? It actually reduced the time spent on answering people's inquiries for the career public service. Previously, if you have to red act a lot of things, if you have uh, to receive the phone calls and so on, uh, each caller doesn't know there's already 40 people who called saying the same things. Uh, and now uh, with the digital democracy platform, the joint platform, uh, these questions only need to be answered once and people can find via search engine the issues they want answers for and therefore uh, contribute instead of uh, just uh, demanding information, right? Demanding information is at the very, very beginning of the engagement scale. Uh, and it was that automatically published in the flow of work, uh, not only it's time saving, it's actually also reducing risk. Because if I'm a public servant and I approve a freedom of information request, then I have to ensure uh, the correctness of the data. And if there's a mistake, I will be accountable to that. On the other hand, if I just say, you know, every single item is published 
as soon as it's filed, as soon as it's collected, then even if there are some errors or typos in that data, well, I didn't see it. I see it with uh, everyone, right, on the same time. And so, uh, paradoxically, people uh, see the errors, but they don't blame anyone. We just uh, look at how to improve it together. And so, um, yeah. there's not much engagement when the uh, system is working well. But if it doesn't work well, having a constantly published uh, data makes sure people think about a solution together instead of go back asking information, not receiving them, starting blaming each other. So that is the true value of radical transparency. So your day, I mean, the way you collect data, the way you deal with data, you receive an enormous amount of amount of information. How do you handle this? How does a regular day of yours mm -hmm. look like? Well, I make sure that these systems publish as soon as they collect. So I'm not the bottleneck. I don't have to look at it uh, before it's published. And yeah. that is the key because I do not have the time to go through all those data. Uh, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that if the data is published in real time, uh, we call this the open API for a openly accessible application programming interface, then it is up to the users of the data, the people who build systems based on the data to inspect the data quality and participate in data governance to make it better. So in my day, I mostly work on systemic issues. Uh, I attend, for example, the office hours every Wednesday. Any social innovator that's registered in our si.taiwan.gov.tw platform can book 40 minutes of my time to discuss exactly how the government is preventing them from fulfilling their public good uh, missions. And because these meetings are on public record, everybody speak with the future generation in mind because the future generation will go back and look at these transcripts and video. Uh, and so people would not make very short-sighted suggestions to the benefit of them by sacrificing other people or sacrificing future generations. So I feel very safe in this very long-term view of on the record radical transparency based is still lobbying, but it's lobbying for the common good. So how is the, the usage of this do you see an increase i mean you started oh, yes, definitely. i don't definitely yeah i started in 2016 uh, and yeah. the engagement has dramatically increased. Back in 2016, not many people know there is a digital democracy platform. But as I mentioned, around half of population now use it quite regularly. Uh, before um, the COVID, for example, people did not know there's a national health insurance app <laughs> that you can use for uh, checking your dentist and doctor visits, to get your vaccine shots, to, to track uh, the, you know, um, the, the shipments of masks and now vaccines and so on. Uh, it's very convenient, but again, not many people are aware of its existence, but the uptake has been uh, sharply uh, climbing during uh, 2020. It's actually the, the top downloaded app, as I mentioned. So I can say many more examples, but I do think COVID is a true accelerator. Yeah, I can imagine. And how did you, how did you yourself find your way into government. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's quite yeah. unusual. Yeah, we, we, occupied, like we occupied the parliament, so we kind of invited <laughs> ourselves in. Uh, and um, in 2014, March, uh, we occupied the parliament for three weeks in a demonstration with half a million people on the street and many more online on the trade deal with Beijing regime. Uh, and uh, it's nonviolent uh, with facilitation and live streaming and the 20 or so NGOs. We settled on four demands and not one less. And it was ratified by the head of the parliament and all the public service wanted to learn about this new way of listening at scale because certainly they don't want the parliament to be occupied every time there's a controversial issue discussed. Where do you take your confidence from, you know, to do these things? Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes courage mm -hmm. and uh, it's not always easy. Mm -hmm. Where do you take this confidence uh, mm -hmm. from that, you know, that you mm -hmm. are on the right way and that mm -hmm. you do need to do these things? Well, I'm very optimistic about this, maybe because the first public servant that I really did the civil disobedience uh, act with 
uh, was the head of my middle school. <laughs> and, and she <laughs> took my demands and actually uh, made it happen in a way that's surprisingly nice and easy for me. So I always had this idea that public servants are the most innovative people. It shapes uh, my outlook on public service. And after I dropped out of middle high, as I mentioned, I participate in internet governance communities yeah. where I'm not discriminated against by my um, language ability or by my, I don't know, gender or age or any other uh, um, demographics, right? I, I was just uh, treated as a peer uh, based on the merit of my suggestion. So that also makes me very optimistic because I understand it is possible for a political system to work in such a way. And finally, uh, I mentioned the Gutenberg project. Well, a fun tidbit is that when I drop out of middle school in 95, um, the Gutenberg project only contains the classical works written before the First World War because anything after that was still uh, under copyright and not in public domain. So my first reading online are those works before the First World War, and the people were much more optimistic uh, than the uh, two <laughs> world wars. So where do you see this going? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I and think, how yes. do you see your role in there? Uh -huh. Yes, uh, I think uh, there's two directions. The first is international, because we now have a good experience of people working on digital transformation, counter-pandemic, in a worldwide scale on the same urgency. We did not have that before. So obviously, the world is going to see these things at a higher priority and apply these ideas to work on other structural global issues, such as climate change, uh, carbon management, uh, and things like that. So I'm very optimistic in the scope being expanded because previously we're on an island, we care about climate. People on larger continents may not care that much about climate because for us it's next generation. For other people, maybe it's two or three generations. But nowadays, uh, after COVID, everybody understands, hey, it's the same urgency. We can work together with the same urgency. That's first. The second is that I see that the uh, democratic impulses um, of the digital democracy uh, being led uh, into a place where people actually see that democracy itself can be improved. This is very important because otherwise uh, there are another um, a way of saying that says only lockdown or takedown or top down or shutdown works uh, when dealing with the virus either of the body or of the mind. So currently there is this competition of imaginations. Either more democracy actually manages this better, you don't have to sacrifice human rights or freedom of speech, and you can actually understand the virus better and fight it better, or do people say, no, let's go back to the 20th century top-down authoritarian methods because the 21st century problems are just too large for the 21st century democracies to deal with. Of course, with the Taiwan model, we're leading on this uh, way, but I also understand many other jurisdictions are seeing democracy at a decline. So this is going to be a tension point uh, in the next few years as well. Yeah, this is what I was just going to say. What you describe and what you do is basically the extreme opposite of what we see mm -hmm. in even many Western countries, right? Mm -hmm. Just look at the US, uh, what we mm -hmm. had there. Mm -hmm. So, and there is always when I talk about, you know, New Zealand is another such example. Yes. Uh, <laughs> And then people like Taiwan, mm -hmm. it's, it's, an excuse is always, you know, these are little countries. Mm -hmm. We can't do this uh, mm -hmm. on a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. What would be your answer to this? Well, 23 million people is not exactly small. Uh, in the Taiwan's case, um, it's actually pretty large. Uh, and with the population density, it's actually harder for us to contain a virus if the virus goes viral, uh, because the transmission cannot be controlled just by spacing out people. We can't space out people. So mm -hmm. uh, I would say a couple of things. First, um, if you have universal broadband and digital competence uh, skills, then the size doesn't matter. Everyone is literally in the same room. It can be arranged so that they are in the same room. So what's important is to get the infrastructure going and then size cease to matter. That's the first answer. And the second answer is, yes, it's true that we are smaller jurisdictions, but 
even with a large jurisdiction like the U.S., still there are states that are even smaller than Taiwan population-wise. So if you cannot do this in the federal level, any legislator, Senate or Congress people can try in their state, right? There's nothing stopping them to try this on a smaller jurisdictional scale. Mm -hmm. Do you have any kind of menu, so to speak, how you digest information, news, do you have any kind of habits, you know, mm -hmm. yes. how you use media information mm -hmm. and then drive your conclusions? Yes, uh, very easily. Uh, I read uh, without passing judgments, without sounding in my head, and I always sleep for eight hours every day or more at least eight hours. So I would read the information from all the sides without taking sides, go to sleep with that information and always wake up with a more synthetic, more holistic viewpoint. If there's too many different sides, I just work more. I will sleep for 10 hours, for example, and then wake up with something interesting. Cool, I think this was a very nice ending point. Thanks a lot, Audrey. Mm -hmm. uh, I will let you know what mm -hmm. all I'll make out of this. Okay. Uh, and keep you updated. Of course. And Is I will okay? paste the video link to the Skype chat uh, in just a few minutes. And then I can download? Yes, and then you can download. Cool. I also look at mine and that's it. Okay, excellent. Okay, I'll send you the stuff. Have a nice uh -huh. afternoon. Yes. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Live Bye. long and prosper. Bye. Bye. Bye.